Hello, thanks for joining me today. This is Phil Friday with Reliable Automatic Sprinkler Company, and I'm here to talk about storage fire protection strategies in modern warehouses. As you can see in the background here, this is the Christmas time. So, so Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays uh, to wherever you are in the world. Um, here's what we'll cover today. Um, a couple of things. First, we'll start with commodity classification, which is a very foundational piece of uh, any discussion related to storage fire protection. Uh, I always like to try to cover the origin and history of ESFR, uh, sprinkler protection, or what some people refer to as ceiling only sprinkler protection. Um, we'll touch on some of the specific application ESFR sprinklers and talk about the history of those as well and the importance of storage capacity. And then um, final, we'll, we'll wrap it up and sign off. So have some examples of the different commodities that are used in uh, standard testing that you can see scrolling through here. This is a class four commodity. Um, one of the more common commodities you see in testing are the uh, are the cup commodities that are the carton unexpanded group A plastics. But you, you see there that um, all of the different variants of, of different commodities that there are. So you have class one through four, carton unexpanded, uh, carton expanded, um, uncartoned, unexpanded, uh, which would, that is also known as your, um, your plastic pallets, or that's what's used for that particular standard test commodity, and, and then finally you have um, uncartoned expanded. And so with that, it's uh, probably a good time to jump into the history of ESFR sprinkler protection. Um, and this is always an interesting discussion, especially for those who might be newer in the industry. Um, the first ESFR sprinklers were developed uh, in the mid 90s. And uh, this was a joint effort between the different sprinkler manufacturers and FM Global. And um, those efforts culminated in um, a test series, which was the first fire to large scale fire test series that was conducted um, in the summer of 1985. And so again, these tests were conducted um, at UL's facility, or excuse me, at FM Global's facility um, and their test and research lab. And um, here's a table that can be a bit of an eye chart, but I'd like to leave this up for a little bit because the data is absolutely uh, fascinating to look at. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit about what, uh, what, what were the outcomes and, and the learnings from this test series and how that led us to where we are today. Um, so a couple of key points. So the test series was a, um, used a, the, a K14 sprinkler and, and all of the sprinkler manufacturers submitted a, a K14 sprinkler for use. And it happened to be a sprinkler that's no longer or a manufacturer that's no longer um, uh, in business, but the American Sprinkler Company of Amer or the uh, uh, Automatic Sprinkler Company of America, uh, their sprinkler is the one that was selected. And all of the tests were done uh, under a 30 foot ceiling. Uh, with different storage heights. So storage heights are at the 30 foot ceiling or 9.1 meters, depending on where you, uh, where you are in the world um, and different storage heights. So from 13 uh, feet, 10 inches or 4.2 meters, uh, 18 uh, feet, 10 inches or 5.7 meters or 23 uh, feet, eight inches or 7.2 meters of storage. And all the tests used um, was uh, consists of storage in double row racks. And we'll see what double row racks look like in a, in a later slide, if, we don't, um, if that's an unfamiliar uh, terminology, and, and using CUP commodity. And so what is CUP commodity? Um, uh, CUP is an acronym for carton done expanded plastics. And you can see the image in the bottom right-hand corner yeah, showing what CUP commodity is. It's basically um, polystyrene cups that are um, nested in, uh, or not nested, they're in individual um, locations within and separated by dividers in cardboard carton. So um, 
four foot aisle in between the racks and um, the operating pressure uh, for what was typical for each of the tests was a 50 PSI or 3.4 bar um, operating pressure. And so um, they ended up running a total of 10 tests. Several of those were duplicates. And in very quick summary, um, they ran two under one test and each one of those uh, only one sprinkler operated. And then, and then they ran three centered between two tests. Um, and so what I'm referring to when I talk about centered between two is uh, these ignition locations are um, where the ignition is compared to the sprinkler array at the ceiling. And so if we say under one, your, your sprinkler would be directly above our, uh, the ignition location. If we say oh, between two, um, it would be in between the two and then between four would obviously be in between a quadrant of four. So um, two under one tests, three uh, between two tests and one, two, three, four, five um, centered between four tests. Now it's worth touching on some of the different things that um, that occurred or, or, or talking about the results. And so again, you're under one test, only one sprinkler activated. And that's what the large uh, number uh, is, indicates. You're centered between two tests. Um, two of those tests you operated uh, two and three respectively. Um, but the third between two tests, they operated 11 sprinklers. And it's probably worth mentioning at this point that what they were trying to accomplish or the goal of the test series was that they would only operate four sprinklers. Um, and that, that's what they were hoping would happen. Obviously, looking at the data, that's not what happened. Um, this, this test, this in-between two, center between two tests where they operated at, uh, 11 sprinklers, they had one of the sprinklers plugged um, trying to represent a, um, an obstruction or um, something that went wrong or you know an actual uh, uh, a sprinkler that failed to operate. Uh, they no longer do that in, in uh, large-scale certification tests, uh, but I think it's interesting to note that that was, um, that was done at the time. And then you have your centered between four tests. Again, there's five of those. Um, one that they ran operated 10 sprinklers, and that, again, was many more than they thought would actually uh, operate. And... Um, so then they ran a uh, what they referred to as a high pressure test. So four sprinklers operated in that high pressure test, and it was it, they started at 150 psi, and they dropped the pressure down as as additional sprinklers operated. So the final sprinkler operated uh, was was flowing at 133 psi, um, and then eight sprinklers, three, and then they did a low pressure test at 25 psi. And they operated eight. So one of the things that that came out of this is you really can't expect only four sprinklers to operate um, and so they really went to and studied uh, and tried to understand why um, the things happened the way they did and one of the conclusions was that opening sequence is critical in, in other words um, which sprinklers open in what order matters. And they went so far as to identify what, what, what is considered in sequence versus out of sequence. So in sequence is when two sprinklers operate side by side and out of sequence is when two sprinklers operate diagonally. And, and, and in sequence is, was uh, theoretically supposed to be a good thing and out of sequence is theoretically uh, not a good thing. And so um, but they thought based on the information that they had that the opening sequence was critical to the number of sprinklers that will operate. So here's an example on the right-hand side that, where you can see the sprinklers, the number that, uh, and they're numbered, and it shows which order they operated in. And here, this would be considered an out of sequence uh, test. So you had a total of 10 sprinklers that operated and your first two that operated were diagonally across from one another. This was one of the between, this was the between four tests we talked about. 
um, where, uh, where Tim sprinklers operated. A couple of other examples. Uh, if, you, if you dive into the test data, here's on the left hand side, you'll see a between uh, two tests. And again, your one and two sprinkler, that, so the one and two are diagonally from one another. So theoretically, that was supposed to be a bad thing, but it was a successful result. And, and then in the test on the right hand side, you can see this is one where it's, this is another between four where we opened eight sprinklers. And uh, the first two that activated were uh, next, next to each other. And so that should have been a good result. So it started to, that starts to raise questions about whether, about how, how critical is opening sequence or if that particular way of um, thinking about operating sequence uh, is important. Well, <clears throat> it turns out it's very complicated and um, so complicated that it, even now in 2023, we continue to do large scale testing to validate whether or not a, um, a new product um, it works in, in a different scenario. So the ability to predict is still not there. And um, my personal uh, thinking on this is that the reason this is the case is because sealing flows become very complicated when buoyancy induced flows, so smoke and heat, interact with hydrodynamic flows from a sprinkler spray. And then your hydrodynamic or your, your uh, buoyancy induced flows are also going to vary, especially after your first sprinkler activates. Um, and they're going to vary again after the second and the third and the fourth. And that's why uh, sprinkler activation beyond the first sprinkler is very difficult to predict. So after the tests in the mid nineties, um, everyone made a K14 sprinkler and that was the first ESFR sprinkler on the market. And there was design criteria for it, uh, ceiling only criteria for ceiling heights up to 30 feet. Uh, and I believe eventually up to 40 feet. Um, and that continued through the 90s. Um, around 2000, uh, number the K617 and K25 sprinklers came along. And then something else interesting happened in 2008. There was a, um, there was a, a look back at the K14 and the criteria that um, that was in the codes and standards for a protection under a 40 foot ceiling. And so UL ran a, um, a test to essentially recertify the K14 uh, for use. And so it was a it was K14 or K200 at 75 PSI or 52, or excuse me, 5.2 bar. And which has an equivalent density of about 1.21 gallons per minute per square foot, uh, 49 millimeters per minute. Storage up to 20 feet and ceiling uh, of 40 feet or, or 6.1 meter storage and 12.2 meter ceiling. And it was an, what's considered an offset between two ignition location where um, instead of being right centered between two, they, they take the ignition location and offset it a foot or two. And what happened in these in this test was that uh, 16 sprinklers activated. This was and this was a big deal at the time because there were a lot of buildings that had K14s, K200s at 75 psi uh, installed, and so they looked at what happened and they said, "Well, let's let's run a realistic test. A realistic test being in, in a real building, uh, the sprinkler." You have a sprinkler system, it's been designed over 12 heads, and your first sprinkler is not going to operate at 75 psi. It's going to operate at a much higher pressure. And so they did what's called a declining density test, uh, where they, they decided we'll, we'll operate the first four sprinklers at 100 psi, which is reasonable if you're um, familiar with or performing hydraulic calculations or reviewing them and see what happens. And so uh, they ran that test and they operated even more sprinklers 
and so that was uh, that was eye opening, and that's ultimately resulted in uh, the K fourteen or K two hundred criteria at forty under forty foot ceilings being removed from NFPA thirteen. Just a quick look at the test layout uh, for those tests in 2008 and a bit of an eye chart, but you can see that's many more sprinklers than you expect to operate in, the, in an ESFR test. So listen to me talk for a little bit and let's it, I always like to show a few fire tests. Um, before we show this test, I think I want to preface it with the um, I want to show you a test of, of um, one of the most challenging commodities that that we deal with in terms of standard commodities. In other words, that that aren't lithium ion batteries or that aren't um, hazmats, aerosols, flammable liquids, and so forth. So this is a brief snippet from a um, a test in it that uh, su surprised me. I, um, I was standing on the balcony at UL, and before I could write. By the time I got the camera going, this is what it looked like. And so this is just 15 feet of storage under a 30 foot ceiling. And so you wouldn't think that this would, um, that you, you would think that a robust ESFR sprinkler system at the roof would be able to handle this. And there is a very robust ESFR sprinkler system at the roof. But let me let you watch what happens. smoke that you see in the end there is just really concealing your view. That's, um, that's the sprinkler uh, momentum uh, driving smoke down towards the floor, but that test was um, uh, ultimately resulted in, in a failure. So with that, let's talk a little bit about um, something else important that happened in the industry in terms of ceiling only sprinkler protection. And that is the, the um, uh, introduction of the specific application uh, sprinklers for buildings 48 feet tall. And um, where did this come from? Well, uh, turns out it came from some individuals sitting at UL and, and tests were typically conducted up to 45 feet. And someone said, well, how tall does this ceiling really go? And they, they found out that it went up to 48 feet. So, so everyone wanted to test as high as they could. Um, so this was um, early 2000s. And so the first specific application sprinkler was the reliable model HL22. And that first specific application listing uh, achieved, uh, was at 55 PSI, um, and an eight foot aisle and aisles are very important. We'll talk much more about aisles um, here uh, later in the presentation. And then another manufacturer came along with their K25 sprinkler and were able to get an eight foot aisle, but they were, their operating pressure was 45 PSI. Uh, more flow, so depends on what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, those were the two things in the market, uh, available in the market at the time. Um, then another manufacturer came along and bested both. They, they, they were able to get to a six foot aisle with 35 PSI using a K28 sprinkler. So the first K28 on the market. And then uh, another manufacturer came along and was, was able to get four foot aisles. <clears throat> it's worth um, go, going back here and saying, and um, pointing out that after manufacturer B uh, got to six foot aisles, uh, manufacturer A went and said, well, we're going to take our K25 and see if we can get to five foot aisles. 
and they did that. And so that was the king in uh, the specific application world for a while um, until manufacturer C came along and got four foot aisles. Um, and so then something else happened very recently. And that is that we were, we released our um, K28 or, or the reliable N28 sprinkler. And so let's talk a little bit about the design criteria for, for this sprinkler that has a specific application listing. Um, it's, a, it's an ESFR pendant sprinkler. It's a K28 or K404, 400, uh, 212 degree Fahrenheit or 100 degree C uh, operating uh, fusible element. Um, and then this is has a uh, CULUS listing, specific application listing for building heights, 48 feet, up to 48 feet, and storage heights um, uh, as tall as 43 feet. Maximum working pressure of 175, uh, and it comes with our W5 installation wrench. You can find the technical bulletin on our website. So what's it good for? It's good for class one through four commodities and cartoned unexpanded group A classics. Um, open frame racks, single and double, just like all of the other specific application listings. Um, this one also has a multiple row, it's, it's, can, can be used for multiple row racks and portable racks. And, and uh, the N28 has uh, four foot aisles or 1.2 meter aisles and flue spaces per NFPA, uh, NFPA 13. So that's our model N28T6. There are two models, as we'll see here shortly. And we'll just go back through all of the specific application listings so you, there's a comparison. So here's the reliable uh, N28T6 on the right, intermediate temperature, uh, multiple row racks, portable racks, uh, four foot aisles, uh, 35 PSI, and a very attractive total flow rate. So time for another fire test. So let's look at one of the um, tests that we conducted with the N28 for approval. I don't, I, yep.
So unlike in the earlier test that we saw where the smoke obscuration kind of left you to wonder what the result was, that one was a very successful result. Um, that, that, that was what you will hear referred to as a high clearance test. So um, I think that was about 23, uh, 28 feet of storage under a 48 foot ceiling. And so um, those, those are challenging. And if you remember our earlier discussion about what happened with the K-14 in, the, in 2008, the, it, was, it was high clearance tests that, that ultimately did it in or caused it to be um, reevaluated. And so with that, I, I like to spend some time talking about uh, storage efficiency in large warehouses. So we're gonna use a million square foot building as an example. Of course, not every building's a million square feet, but um, this, is, this is a good way to evaluate uh, um, how much product you can store and how your different fire sprinkler protection options have an influence on that. So, so the number of things that influence storage efficiency, building height obviously is one, um, rack arrangement is another, <clears throat> and then your fire sprinkler protection is, is another. And I think it's often discounted or um, people will often overlook the influence that the sprinkler selection can have. So we're gonna talk through that a little bit and, and maybe try to um, bring some, a better understanding to it. So there's different criteria that you can use uh, for protecting a, a warehouse almost anywhere in the world. You can either use FM Global and they have their data sheet 8-9 um, and if you're in a taller warehouse, you're, you'll find yourself in table 17B. And we're going to talk more in detail about this, but you can see there are options um, for buildings up to 50 feet and buildings up to 55 feet. So if your buildings are up to 50 feet, you've got options using K, anything from a K-22 to a K-34. We'll talk more about what those different options are. If you're in a building with a maximum ceiling height of 50 feet or less, or 16.8 meters or less, um, there's really two options that are available. And so this is an interesting exercise to go through. So NFPA 13, which is used mostly in North America um, and many other places in the world, but it, most jurisdictions in North America, this is the um, uh, rule of law, if you will. You're, Maximum building height is 48 feet, unless you're using a specific application listing. Um, and so looking at your, your options for building heights up to 45 feet and storage heights up to 40 feet. Um, and, and if you have four foot aisles using a K-22 or K-25, um, this is your available uh, storage, what we're going to say cube, right? So we're going to use that as our baseline, 26.6 million square feet of um, available storage cube in a million square foot building. And so what if you decide you want to use uh, FM's criteria? Well, that's fine. That's good. And But there's some things to be aware of. And one of those is that if you use FM's criteria, you're allowed to build it taller. Uh, and, and you're also allowed to store taller but your aisles cannot be as narrow. So the minimum aisle width from um, in, in 8-9 of table 17B is six feet. So when you go and you do that calculation, you actually lose available Q. And so knowing it's expensive to build tall, it's worth understanding these things um, and how, how, they're, how they influence available Q because that is a very important piece of uh, what an end user wants in their warehouse. So what if you decide to build even taller? You say, you know what? Okay, I recognize that 50 feet maybe doesn't get me where I need to be. I'm going to build it to 55 feet, peak roof deck height, and I'll be able to store up to 50 feet. And there are options, uh, available options for that. Um, but if you, you go with the K28, you're going to be limited to eight foot aisles. And so you basically will have to use a K34 sprinkler 
Um, and there you could get 28.6 million cubic feet. So that's a viable option. Um, and then there are the specific application listing options, which every sprinkler manufacturer has. So let's look at those and compare them together. Um, and it really, as, as we've seen, it really boils down to the aisle width that you're able to use. And that determines what your available storage capacity is. So if you get a six foot aisle, you're only going to be able to store 24.6 million cubic feet of material, which is no better than if you built a building to 45 feet, right? And just used a standard K22 or K25. Um, if you or find a sprinkler that has a five foot aisle, that then you can improve things some. Um, but if you can find a sprinkler that has a four foot aisle, um, you really increase your available storage capacity and it's worth noting here that, uh, you know, these examples are based on eight foot deep double row racks. There'll be some variation. This is um, supposed to be a, a catch all for every, every possible scenario. But um, we're, we, we, this, this is why we developed the K28 to, to give end users and owners the ability, uh, end users, tenants and owners, the ability uh, to store more in their buildings and give them greater flexibility in how they use their buildings. So what about multiple row racks? Um, here's the description from FM 8-9 for multiple row racks. Um, and so they're, they're basically racks that don't have an aisle. They can be maximum of 20, 20 feet deep um, before you need an aisle, in other words. And so, but that's as long as they have adequate flu spaces in both directions. And so here again, um, there's only a couple of choices if you uh, want to have multiple row racks in your building. And so Let's talk a little bit about something else that we were able to accomplish in developing the N28. There's another model, the N28 T3, um, that is listed for, um, that is listed, has the same listing criteria as the T6, but you, it allows you to use um, or store with three, three inch flues, transverse flues, thus the T3 transverse flue, three inches. So this also saves quite a bit in terms of storage capacity. And so let's look at what that looks like. You can still do single, double, multiple row racks, portable racks. Um, now the th minimum three inch transverse flue is only for single and double row racks. But worth comparing again, um, what this looks like. And so here is the N28 T3. Um, and you can see that that uh, it's a very attractive option if you're planning to build a large warehouse um, and you're looking at, at taller. So what does that look like visually? About a 6% increase in available storage cube that you get with a three inch transverse flue over a six inch. Now that might not sound like a lot, but you multiply that across a million square foot building or a 500,000 square foot building, and uh, it turns out to be a lot of material.
I hope you enjoyed that piece. That's a um, excellent demonstration of, of uh, what the new N28 is capable of doing. And now it's time for another fire test, which is my favorite thing in the world. Um, so let's look at, this is our, this is the 38 foot test um, that was conducted at UL. And um, so 38 feet of storage and uh, under a 40, uh, 48 foot ceiling. So this is a 20 foot clear, still considered a high clear test. Um, and if uh, maybe I'll point out some things because we don't have sound with this, um, but it's those of you who haven't had the opportunity to go uh, witness a large scale test at UL, either, whether that be via um, an online invite or in person. Um, what you're looking at here is in the upper right hand quadrant, also in the lower right hand or like right hand quadrant. You can see the fire's been ignited already. Uh, the B2 stands for between two. And so this is between two sprinklers at the ceiling. And then what you see over here on the upper left hand uh, corner are, uh, is a grid that demonstrates the layout uh, or depicts the layout of the sprinklers at the ceiling. And the numbers that you see are temperatures. And so you'll see the temperatures start to rise as the fire um, approaches the ceiling, starts to bathe the ceiling. And then as the, after the first sprinkler operates, you'll see the number change. Of course, these were out of sync a little bit, not sure what happened there, but um, so this sprinkler um, is, is uh, operating as depicted by this red dot here. Now, now the number indicates what time that sprinkler. So as soon as the dot changes to red, it's telling you what, what, how many seconds it took it to operate. So that one operated in 94 seconds. So about a minute and minute and 34 seconds. Um, still good visibility down low here. We can see the fire starting to be uh, batted down, um, pushed back down um, and, and, and suppressed. Let's just watch and see what happens here. This is obviously a four foot aisle test, if I, you know, if I, I didn't say that. Um, and, and four foot aisle tests are, are very challenging under taller ceilings. Um, and it's one of the reasons why FM Global, once you go above um, 40 feet, you, your only options are six foot or eight foot aisles. So, um, there's a very good reason for it. They're very challenging tests. Um, this was a very successful result here. But you see there's still fire down low, right? And so that sprinkler is still doing its doing um, the hard work. and we'll eventually get to a, a result that's consistent with suppression. So this isn't a million square footer, but it's a large warehouse. This is a you know, potential application for the N28 or the, the T6 or the T3. Um, here again, a, a finished building somewhere in the world, uh, actually looks like an Amazon. Um, and so, uh, that would be another place where you might uh, see something like the, the M28. Um, and and here, are, here are the two models of the M28 side by side. So enjoyed going through this with you today. Um, hopefully if you ever have any questions, you won't hesitate to reach out to us. Um, our technical service department loves to hear from uh, customers, engineers, developers, anyone who's curious about talking about uh, storage, um, storage capacity, automatic storage and retrieval, fire testing, any of those things, uh, feel free to reach out to us Monday through Friday. And thank you so much for taking your time to spend on with me today.